Thank you so much for watching over the last several weeks. We've been doing a project on 27 keys of 27 books uh, here in the New Testament. And uh, we are on 1 Thessalonians tonight. We've looked at Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians. And now we're in 1 Thessalonians, and we're looking at the key verses for each book, that key that unlocks uh, each book of the New Testament. My goal for this series is not so much to uh, go really in-depth through each book, but to uh, whet your appetite uh, for reading the New Testament as well as reading the Bible. And I believe every Christian should um, have a Bible reading program uh, to where they're reading through the scriptures and, uh, and reading through carefully and uh, meditating on them and learning them and growing in Christ. That's my goal. That's my desire uh, through this series and through this project and uh, it's actually going to be the last 27 weeks of 2020. And uh, Lord willing, we'll uh, finish up 2020 there with the, the key verse in Revelation. But uh, with that in mind, I want to mention that uh, this particular study will be the last one on the Spring Hill Baptist uh, Church Facebook page. Uh, I'm currently in transition uh, to my new assignment there at Bethlehem Baptist Church. Uh, so until the transition is complete and I'm settled in there, um, I, I want to plan on doing this still every Thursday, but I'm going to have them on my personal Facebook page as well as my YouTube channel. And all the previous episodes are on my YouTube channel. And uh, I desire to finish this project in this series. Uh, it's something I've wanted to do for a long time and uh, the Lord's allowed me to, uh, to do this. But um, anyway... We come to 1 Thessalonians tonight, and that are the marks of a mighty church. Every time I think of 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians and the church there in Thessalonica, I think of the marks of a mighty church that Paul emphasizes in those letters. I believe all my heart that a mighty church is mighty, not because of its size, not because of the buildings, not because... Not because of any other thing, but this one thing, that that church is surrendered to God the Father and His will. They allow the Lord Jesus Christ to be the head. And they allow the Holy Spirit uh, to work in their lives in an attitude of surrender. A church is mighty because Jesus Christ is preeminent, as well as the people who make it up, who are used by the Holy Spirit and their spiritual gifts. They work together so that the gospel is advanced. And from what I've gathered from studying the church in Thessalonica over the last several years, uh, we see the marks of a healthy and mighty church. Located in modern-day Greece, uh, Thessalonica was originally named Therma uh, from the many hot springs that were adjacent to it. In 315 BC, it was renamed Thessalonica after the half-sister of Alexander the Great. When Rome conquered Macedonia, in 168 BC, the city was made capital of that entire province. In Paul's day, 200,000 people lived there, most of them Greeks, but also many Romans and a strong Jewish minority. In Acts chapter 17, verses 1 through 15, Luke records how Paul came to Thessalonica and how this church was founded. Paul went to Macedonia in response to a call from a man in Macedonia who said, come over to Macedonia and help us there in Acts chapter 16, verse 9. So Paul and Silas and Luke and Timothy, uh, they arrived first in Philippi where they led Lydia or uh, yeah, Lydia and her household to Christ and there established the church. Paul and Silas were arrested on false charges and beaten and put in the jail, but God delivered them. And they were able to lead the jailer in his household of faith in Christ. So from Philippi and the church that was founded there, Paul and his team goes to Thessalonica. And his stay there was not long. The scripture records three Sabbath days and may be continued in another place besides the synagogue. Can't be dogmatic there, but the church was mostly Gentile. However, Paul taught this church a great deal of basic Bible doctrine. As a matter of fact, uh, in the books of 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, every almost every major doctrine of the Christian faith is mentioned. When Paul left, he left behind a thriving church, a mighty church. When he leaves for Athens, Timothy and Silas, they remain there to help the new church 
to disciple the believers and then join Paul later. And when they did meet again, Paul sent Timothy back to Thessalonica to encourage the Christians and to assure them of his love and concern. It was when Timothy rejoined Paul at Corinth and gave him the report on this new church that Paul wrote the letter, the epistle of, that we know as 1 Thessalonians. Paul was concerned about his departing under the pressure and about having to leave the church without experienced leadership. Timothy's report gave Paul cause only for the praise for the health state of the church. This is a letter from a relieved and grateful pastor to his growing flock. Paul wrote this letter because he wanted to assure his friends of his love and concern because he had left the city hastily at night and he did not want them to think he had deserted them. Also, Paul's enemies were attacking his character and telling the new believers that he was only preaching religion to make money. Paul assures his readers that uh, he have his love for them and his honesty in ministering to them. And Paul writes this letter because he wanted to ground them in the, in the doctrines of the Christian faith, particularly in reference with Christ's return. The church was going through severe persecution, like many there in that day in the Roman Empire. And this is always a time of temptation to compromise and give in to discouragement. So by reminding this church of the truths of the Christian faith and what God had done for them in Christ, Paul encourages them to stand firm and maintain their strong witness and also to live holy lives. So as we get to 1 Thessalonians, we see that Paul wrote this church of Thessalonica. He writes them on the topic of sanctification. The theme of this book of the Bible is the salvation in sanctification of believers. The purpose of the book is to urge believers to appropriate conduct as they anticipate the return of Christ and to comfort them concerning the future of those who had died in the Lord. If you want to break the book of uh, 1 Thessalonians down, in chapter 1, we see the people of a mighty church. Chapter 2, we see the leadership and the integrity of of a mighty church. Chapter 3, the central uh, ideas of this book, we see the faith of a mighty church because the just shall live by faith. Chapter 4, we see the lifestyle of a mighty church. In chapter 5, we see the duty of a mighty church. But however, the central idea of the book in which the key verse is located, the key verse, by the way, is 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 11 through 13. And I call this a prayer for the church from Paul then and now. 1 Thessalonians 11, uh, excuse me, 1 Thessalonians 3, 11 uh, through 13. Let's read this together. It says, Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all just as we do to you so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. The theme of chapter 3, once again, is that of the faith of a mighty church. And as chapter 3 opens up, he makes a statement in verse 1, Therefore, when we could no longer endure it, we thought it good to be left in Athens alone and sent Timothy. This statement links us to what Paul had said in chapter 2, verse 17 to 20, uh, when he was longing to see them. He expressed his great love for the believers there, and he was taken from them after just a short time in presence, but not in heart. Since the day he left them, he said he desired to see them again, but Satan had hindered him and told them that they were our hope, our joy, our crown of rejoicing. By the way, that is a crown that we'll receive one day, our crown of hope, joy, crown of rejoicing. And he says there, for you are our glory and joy. I really believe this when we get to heaven someday and we see those we've led to Christ and had a part in their lives and discipled. And man, we're, we see them there. That is a crown in itself, my friend. I've gotten off track. Let me get back on track. And he said to this church, if he didn't see them on this earth again, he would see them in heaven someday. And they were his crown of rejoicing. So what's the background? Why did Paul say what he said 
in this chapter, back to Acts chapter 17. When the Apostle Paul and his missionary team of Silas, Timothy, and Luke, they came to Thessalonica, remember, in the response to the call of Acts 16, 9. And as his custom was, he would go to the synagogue first, to the Jew first, then to the Greek. And he goes there for three Sabbaths or three weeks. He reasons with them out of the scriptures. He's preaching that Jesus had risen from the dead, that he was the Christ, the Messiah, just like he always did. And we do today. Acts 17, 4 tells us that some of them believed and a devout group of Greeks believed and a multitude believed, which led the religious Jews to who did not believe Christ, uh, Jesus was Messiah, that they were moved with envy. They, they set the city in an uproar and assaulted the house of Jason where they thought that Paul and his team were staying, but they could not find them. And while Jason covered for them by putting up a bond to the authorities, the brethren smuggled Paul and his team by night to Berea. The same religious Jews that stirred up Thessalonica came to Berea and did the same thing to Paul and his team. So while Paul went to Athens due to trouble, Timothy and Silas stayed in Berea and Thessalonica, rejoining Paul in Corinth there in Acts chapter 18, verse 5. And apparently from this passage, Timothy did join Paul in Athens, because I note the we there in chapter 3, verse 1 and 2, but Paul sends him back to Thessalonica to help the young church that was going through tribulation. So we must note that Thessalonica was the Roman capital of the province of Macedonia and that the Romans were copiers of Greek Hellenistic culture. They adopted their gods and goddesses as well as their culture. But most importantly, during this time, Caesar desired to be called Lord and God. A lot of emperor worship going on during this time. So when Paul would preach Jesus, not only were the Jews stirred up with envy, but also the Greeks and Romans, because to them Caesar uh, was king and not Jesus, which led to persecution and suffering throughout the Roman Empire. Thus in Thessalonica, there were fanatical priests who were not led by God, but by their own personal religious convictions and motives. They were determined to destroy the church. They were also the craftsmen who knew not God and cared for nothing save their own personal gain. They were not concerned about spiritual matters and would make merchandise of the souls of men. There were multitudes who knew nothing of things spiritual. They knew nothing of the law of God and cared nothing about the grace of God. They were uh, intently irritated by this strange group who called themselves Christians and preached the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus. And all these wicked men were united in their wicked minds to destroy the believers who, Acts chapter 17, verse 6 said, were turning the world upside down. Paul's assuring the believers that they were on the winning side. They were called to suffer, and therefore they should rejoice and be glad to be count worthy to, be su to suffer for the name of Jesus Christ. So Paul says there in chapter 3, I desired to see your face again, and because Satan hindered us, we could no longer forbear. We thought it good to be left at Athens alone and send Timothy to you. And Paul sends Timothy to the Thessalonican church for two reasons. First of all, to comfort them in their hour of persecution and to relive Paul's own ancient heart, to relieve his own ancient heart, excuse me, so sorely distressed and plagued with fears concerning their fiery trials, fearing that perhaps this continued increasing persecution might cause some of the weaker brethren to stumble. It was because of this love he could not abandon them when they needed spiritual help. Paul was not only an evangelist, he was also a pastor, and he knew that the winning of a soul was one part of the commission that God gave him. These new believers must be taught and established in the faith. So Paul chose to be left at Athens alone so Timothy could return to Thessalonica and establish the saints and the churches there in doctrine. The word translated left in 1 Thessalonians 3, 1 means to leave loved ones at death. And in 1 Thessalonians 2, 17, he, he said he felt orphaned from his friends at Thessalonica. The Greek word there also can mean bereaved. Paul was not a hireling shepherd who abandoned the sheep when there's danger. To leave these new believers was like an experience of bereavement. So by sending Timothy and by writing these two epistles containing every doctrine of the scriptures within them, Paul sought to establish the believers in the faith so they would become a mighty church. With this in mind, understand something. Before a child can walk, he first must learn to stand. 
Usually a father and a mother teach a child to stand first in the walk. Paul was sort of the spiritual parent to these uh, young believers in Thessalonica, but he had been forced to leave the city. How then could he help these young Christians learn to stand in the trials of life? In the first two chapters, Paul explains how the church was born and nurtured. Now he dealt with the next step in maturity, how the church was to stand. The two key words in the chapter, in chapter 3, is establish, chapter, two, uh, excuse me, uh, chapter 3, verse 2 and 13, and the word faith. Chapter 3, verse 2, 5, 6, 7, and 10. Establish in faith. The key thought is expressed there in First the Thessalonians 3, 8, where it says, For now we live if you stand fast in the Lord. Note the emphasis of faith on this chapter. As a roaring lion, Satan stalks believers, and we must resist him steadfast in the faith. First Peter 5, 8, 9. So for, before you walk... You must first learn to stand. And because Paul was only there for a short time and sent Timothy to ground them further in truth, Paul was anxious to know about their faith. And he writes to them. So the end of this chapter, as he's talking about the faith of a mighty church, is his prayer for them. And this is the key verse that unlocks the book. And this is our prayer. This is a prayer for, for our, what a prayer this is for our churches today. There's three parts of this prayer. As we look here, once again, in this key, in 1 Thessalonians 3, 11, 12, and 13, I see, first of all, may, the, may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to you. Number one, what's a prayer? That he will direct our paths. Paul is here praying for, th for these things. He prayed, first of all, that God would direct his way to them again someday. Paul longed to see this church again. He longed to minister to them. He longed to help bring their faith to maturity. The word direct is used there in Luke 179, guide our feet into the way of peace. It's also used in Psalm 3723 when it says, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Paul was asking God and the Lord Jesus to direct his steps to the beloved saints there in Thessalonica. And what a prayer! Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not into your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. What a prayer there in verse 11. May, the God, may, may our God and Father and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to you, that he would direct our paths. Number two, that he would not only direct our paths, but he will mature our faith. Notice also, and may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all, just as we do to you. So next, Paul was praying that their faith may mature. A faith that cannot be tested cannot be trusted. God tries our faith not to destroy it, but to develop it. He uses circumstances to try us. Paul also prayed that their love may abound. Times of suffering can also be times of selfishness. We start to look at ourselves Sometimes when we're persecuted and afflicted, we can become very self-centered and very demanding. What life does to us depends on what life finds in us, and nothing reveals the true inner man like the furnace, the hot water of affliction. That's why we develop our character. Some people build walls in times of trial and shut themselves off. Others build bridges and draw closer to the Lord and his people. Our growing faith in God ought to result in a growing love for others. You notice what he says, toward another, each other in the church, and toward all men outside the church. Growth of love in the heart for others, including those saved, not saved, and even your enemies. And this is very difficult for us because apart from the Holy Spirit's power, we can't do that. We naturally don't love. We want to love we have a desire to love, but sin just so taints us. We need extra grace, and the fruit of the Spirit is love. The word abound, the overflowing of love in a believer's heart, thus blessing others through that overflow toward all men, including those not saved, including enemies. And this was very difficult for the church. They needed extra grace, thankful for the grace of God through Christ this evening. So he'll direct our paths, he'll mature our faith. And here's the third part of this prayer, 
that he will establish our hearts blameless in holiness before our God. Verse 13, he will establish our hearts. And this was his final request, holiness of life, directing our paths, maturing our faith, maturing our love, and establishing our hearts, holiness. It, there's a, a, that's an Old Testament expression, establish your hearts. In Psalm 104, 15, also found in James 5, 8, making firm and making steadfast in character and giving a firm confidence and steadfast assurance to the heart, to the inner man. The goal of Paul's prayers, the goal of Paul's labors for the church is that they would be full grown in their inner man, spotless, blameless, unashamed when they stand before the righteous judge to receive the reward for the deeds done in the body. 2 Corinthians 5.10, that they would not be ashamed before Christ that is coming. It is the return of Christ someday. We occupy till he comes, but it is his return that motivates the believer to live a holy life. Our Lord's return is also a source of stability in the Christian life. Where, where there's no stability, there can be sanctity. And when there's no holiness, there's assurance. These two go together. So note this prayer also involves the Trinity. There in verse 11, Paul addresses God the Father in Christ. Verse 12, he addresses the Lord in the form of the Holy Spirit. In verse 13, Paul refers to Jesus Christ. The biblical pattern for prayer is to the Father through the Son, and in the Holy Spirit. Paul prays that his converts might stand blameless and holy before God at Christ's return, referring to what we do for Christ as Christians to be reviewed at the judgment seat of Christ. What a prayer in this key verse. Here's the takeaway. Will you allow the Lord to complete your faith? Most people never make it past verse base in, in their faith. They stay baby Christians. They get saved and that is, that's it. They never grow in Christ. We must all allow the Lord to grow us up in him, step by step, trial by trial, lesson by lesson, etc. In conclusion, we see from chapter three, the central part of this book, how important it is to care for new Christians. Hey, leading somebody to Christ is not enough. We've also got to lead him on in the Christian life and help him get established. And if he's not established, He's going to fall to every wind of persecution starts to blow. If he cannot stand, he'll never learn to walk. What shall we do? Those who are established Christians in the church, be an encouragement. Stand at his side as he matures. We can share the word of God. We can pray. This is what Paul did, and it worked. He was in Thessalonica but three, uh, three Sabbaths, according to Acts, and he sent Timothy to ground them, and, and Paul wrote them the doctrines of scripture, and he prayed for them and it worked. And in his distress and affliction, Paul took courage. We were comforted through your faith. The faith of the Thessalonians was the essential point about which Timothy was to inquire. For they were true to the faith once delivered to the saints and all else would go well, man. Paul knew if they are steadfast, that they, they strengthen their faith, all hell cannot move them regardless of the methods and schemes employed by the devil. Jesus had prayed that Peter's faith fail not. Paul said, by faith you stand. Paul preached, by grace are you saved through faith. Faith comes by hearing and, and, and by, uh, by the word of God. And whatsoever is not of faith is sin. And John said, whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Hebrews, looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. How is your faith tonight? Are you growing? Are you maturing in Christ? Will you allow the Lord to complete your faith? What a prayer we find here in this key verse. Now may the God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to you. May the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all just as we do to you so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. What a prayer that we all become a mighty church growing up in the Lord in Jesus Christ. Hey, thanks so much for watching and, and paying attention. And, and uh, I hope you enjoy this Bible study. Have a great rest of the week and a great weekend. Looking forward to seeing you this Lord's Day. Church uh, services at 945, Sunday schools at 11, and Sunday evening at 6. Hey, thanks for watching once again. Have a great day and a great weekend.